This is the Work Smart Hypnosis Podcast, session number 126. Anthony Gailey on breaking into corporate hypnosis. Welcome to the Work Smart Hypnosis Podcast with Jason Lynette, your professional resource for hypnosis training and outstanding business success. Here's your host, Jason Lynette. Welcome back as always and here again once again with an action-packed, content-packed session with Anthony Gailey. Anthony was on the program back on session number 61 back in May 2016 and excited to have him on here once again. Now what you're actually about to interact with is the audio of a live webinar that Anthony and I did together that's just so good I wanted to share this with a much bigger audience and that's why it's going on here on the podcast. So if you want to watch the actual presentation, you can actually head over to the show notes at worksmarthypnosis.com and we're going to link directly to the video replay of that webinar. The original presentation, uh, just a little bit of an edit here, the original presentation was titled Three Steps to break into corporate hypnosis though as you can hear anthony really opened up the gates and shared practically everything so i had to remove the number because he shares so much more beyond just three simple steps to break into that so what do you say to the corporate market what should you go into that presentation with the goal of and how do you stand out in a crowded marketplace those were the original bullet points, though, again, Anthony is going to share all sorts of nuggets of wisdom, uh, droppings of knowledge bombs, as we like to say here, and just really wonderful information. And stick through this entire presentation because he actually opens up for a bit of a Q&A and you're going to hear some really insightful questions and just from a guy who was really out there working some really outstanding information to learn more about Anthony's trainings you can head over to corporate hypnotist masterclass.com again that's corporate hypnotist masterclass.com there's a lot of information here so with that let's jump directly in this is session number 126 Anthony Gailey on breaking into corporate hypnosis. Welcome everybody. This is the Work Smart Hypnosis webinar series and so excited to be joined here today by Anthony Gailey. Anthony, how are you doing? I'm great. Good to be here. Anthony needs no introduction, so I'm going to let Anthony, how about you introduce yourself then? <laughs> Anthony Gailey, been a corporate speaker for 34 years, uh, traveled around the world doing my presentation. I call it the subconscious aspects of business. And uh, essentially, I train people on how to get and stay focused on their goals. And one of the three techniques that I would show them was self-hypnosis, uh, which is what made my presentation somewhat unique. I'd actually bring people up out of the audience, hypnotize them on stage, uh, run them through a series of hypnotic phenomena, and used the hypnosis as a metaphor for goal setting. Would actually have them uh, experiencing certain hypnotic uh, experiences and phenomena and would relate to that to the uh, business world. Outstanding. Different. And I'm going to hype that uh, a little bit stronger from the sense that Understand that as we're talking about hypnosis, whether it's the hypnotherapy side of seeing clients, yes, we can go out and give lecture demos to grow our business, whether it's the stage hypnosis side, uh, whether it's going out and doing single shows, events for schools, corporate groups as well. There are a lot of people who would position themselves really more so as the stage hypnotist who is working for corporate groups. Right. So how would you define what, what you do as different than that? Well, I had not ever thought of myself as a stage hypnotist. I know that sounds odd, but I mean, when you look at what I do, it clearly is to a degree stage hypnosis, but that's not how I ever thought of myself. So when I started putting together my program, I branded myself as a person that was an expert in goal setting, uh, showing people simple hands-on techniques to internalize goals at the subconscious level. And one of the three techniques that I would teach was hypnosis. And indirectly, what that did, that had the, the effect of kind of taking away the stigma of hypnosis. When I would say to people that I am an expert in goal setting and I teach people simple transferable techniques, they can walk out the door uh, from my presentation and immediately start using these techniques to push up their business production. And oh, by the way, one of the three, techni three techniques was hypnosis. 
that tended to intrigue people as opposed to scare them. Whereas if I said that I'm a stage hypnotist or I'm a, you know, a hypnotherapist who uses hypnosis to help people set their goals, uh, if the words out of my mouth, first words were that I'm a hypnotist, that tended to evoke a very fixed reaction. Oh, I know what a hypnotist is. You know, I saw one last year on a cruise ship. They make people dance with broomsticks and quack like dunks, ducks, you know. And so it, it uh, the way I, I structured it tended to bring out a different first impression. And it, it ended up being very, very positive for me because then they would actually listen to what I was saying. Their question would then be, be, well, how does hypnosis work for goal setting? How how could that be something that would be effective as a business tool as opposed to uh, the hypnosis is you know, dancing with broomsticks? How is that going to help business? So by structuring it the way I did, almost accidentally, it tended to bring out a more positive, evoked a more positive response from people. So. Yeah, outstanding. And what I'd reference just to give some real numbers behind it and the stage hypnosis side of things where many people were perhaps doing relatively well for themselves with maybe $1,500 to $2,000 shows, uh, yours were upwards of like 5,000 and much higher as well, correct? Yeah, it start, started at 5,000 and then they rapidly moved me up to the 65, 75. And then by the time I was finished, I was doing 11 to 12, five for a speech. And that's because in the corporate world, eventually you get, uh, if you're any good, you eventually get used by and picked up by speaker bureaus. And speaker bureaus collect a commission for booking you. And they're just not going to want to book you if you're not charging at least $5,000 because they get either a 20 or 25% commission. So if, you're, you know, if your fee is $5,000, they're collecting $1,000. If your fee is $10,000, they're collecting you know, $2,000. So naturally, from their point of view, they would want to book speakers that had a higher, uh, you know, a higher price range from their point of view. So uh, unless you booked at least 5,000, they, they would tell you flat out, if you're not going to be booking yourself at at least 5,000, we're, we're probably not even going to look at you. You can be the best speaker in the world. We're probably not going to book you because, you know, we, we put a certain, certain amount of time and effort into getting these bookings. And why would I put time and effort into someone that's, going to earn me a thousand dollars in commission what i could put the same amount of time and effort in someone that's going to earn me you know, five or six thousand in commission so i love it and especially now that uh mostly retired from giving these talks and now switching your focus to that of training i'd mentioned coming up in las vegas october 25th and 26th you can get all the details over at corporate hypnotist masterclass.com. It's a two-day training event that I've actually personally attended myself and everything from the presentation to the marketing. And in this time together today, I've um, pulled at the, uh, at the intentions enough to get you on here and uh, give you the title of three steps to break into corporate hypnosis. So giving people some actionable strategies to get out there and start to break into new markets, start to break into new territories and really take these markets to higher levels. So again, rather than the hypnotist with a single client, single session stuck in that dollars for hours model, rather than being at the threshold of the stage hypnotist, let's go a little bit bigger. So with that, let's jump right in. I know your first bullet point to chat with here was in terms of, uh, and you've alluded to this to some degree, but let's spend some time about uh, the first step about uh, what do you speak about? Uh, because I imagine, correct me on this, these are groups that very clearly want just a lecture demo on the history of hypnosis, how it works, and what services hypnosis is good for, right? Yes and no. Uh, <laughs> Hopefully. <laughs> the, the paradox of corporate hypnosis is that you're now dealing with businesses. I came from a background of hypnotherapy, so I've done hypnotherapy. In college, I did some stage hypnosis. I mean, it wasn't a you know, big business. It wasn't a terribly professional, but I did stage hypnosis. So I've, I've had exposure to both of those fields. And when you're dealing with uh, stage hypnosis, you're, you're talking about entertainment. You know, the, these people, you want to um, entertain them. And uh, at the end, the emphasis is often on the hypnotist. The so-and-so did a great job, or he and she was such a great entertainer, or had them rolling in the aisles. And when you're talking about corporate hypnosis or business hypnosis, it's actually really quite different. You're at that point, the focus and emphasis is on your audience. 
how to help them make more money, how to get them to go out there and um, to generate more income. So that's what you're, you're looking for. Of everybody's favorite radio station is what's in it for me. Yeah, I mentioned to people when they come to my program before they come that if you were to call three meeting planners up today, if you if you pick up the phone and call three meeting planners who would potentially hire you as a speech or as a speaker sometime in the future, one of those three, I'd be surprised if you called three and at least one of those three didn't ask you the following question. What are my people going to get out of your program? What are they going to have at the end of your program that they don't have today? In other words, What's the value in, in if we're going to pay you $10,000 to come in and give a speech, what are we getting for our 10 grand? Uh, if we want an entertainer, if we want you to sing and dance and make them laugh, we'll tell you. But this is a business conference. We want our people to do more business, to make more money, to push up their productivity. They've all got some kind of an agenda that revolves around business. And it's a transition. It, it, it's a shift in thinking because for the longest time, I thought of it as, uh, again, being an entertainer, uh, satisfying the audience, making them happy, making them laugh, doing a good job. And yet the client that's hiring me is often thinking along different terms. They're thinking, what did this guy or woman just teach these people that's going to help them go out there and bump up their numbers, make more money, generate more income for this company? It's just a slightly different way of looking at things, but it is, it's a powerful difference because if you start honing in on that about how they could be, you know, use this technique and you'll make more sales. Generate this, you'll overcome your fear of rejection. Use this technique and you'll pick up the phone more often. Uh, the, the people that are hiring you are sitting back there saying, now that's valuable to me. That's, that's, that's going to help these people go out there and generate more business, more sales, more customer service, what, whatever it happens to be. But if you're up there and saying, isn't that funny? You know, isn't that amazing? Didn't I just do an amazing thing by having them talk into their shoe? That's the emphasis is now on the hypnotist. And from a business point of view, that's, that's funny, that's entertaining, but they don't see it as being uh, very valuable to business. Uh, it's just a subtle yet powerful shift. You, if you're dealing with businesses, you gotta start thinking like a business. And I recall, coming out of the hypnotherapy world and out of the, you know, doing the stage hypnosis, that it was a subtle yet very powerful shift in the way I thought about things, the way I looked at things, and it made a difference. So if I can recap that, uh, the, the first bullet point here, the first step of what do you speak about, it kind of goes into uh, uh, your step ahead of us in terms of what the second step was about leaving the audience better than you found them. You know, what are the strategies that you can actually use so that these things are actionable, these things that they can actually put into use and whether it's physical, whether it's something tangible of they can use this strategy and now here's going to be their result. Right. Right. You know, uh, typically I will open the presentation by saying, here's who I am. You know, this is, this is what the topic of the presentation is going to be. And in this presentation, this is what I'm going to do. Uh, for example, I'm going to show you three simple hands-on techniques to internalize goals. Uh, by the time this program is over, you will have learned three new ways of uh, programming your subconscious mind to, to you know, push up your business production by internalizing these goals. So I'm, I'm telling them up front, this is what you're going to learn. And then when I go through my presentation, I said, you know, here's the first technique. Remember I promised you three? Well, here's the first technique. And let me show you how it will help you push up production. Here's the second technique. And then, oh, by the way, here's the third technique. You're probably wondering what these chairs are doing up here, but this third technique actually involves self-hypnosis. Uh, before you, know, you let the word scare you, it's actually a very common state of mind. You know, it's been around for a thousand years. I'm just gonna show you how to uh, use it to become more of a moneymaker. It's actually a very common state, similar to daydreaming. So I give them a description of what it is and then roll into this hypnosis demonstration. So when the program is over, I summate. If you recall, I started by saying I was going to show you three ways, and I showed you the first technique, and then I rolled into the second, second technique, and then, as you saw, I demonstrated the third technique with hypnosis, and those three techniques will all help you push up business production. Now, you can use one out of three, two out of three, three out of three, but do something. You know, any of these will help you push up your numbers. Well, what's interesting of that is it's kind of taking this more of a, let, let's call it out this way, that hypnotherapist mindset into the stage environment. And by meshing these two worlds together, 
you're working with them in such a way that people then can take action upon it and uh, then using that demonstration to then reinforce those points, correct? Exactly. And a comment that I got early on when I first started doing it and have heard many, many, many times since, people will come up afterwards and say something to the effect that, you know, this thing you're talking about visualizing your goals and the power of visualization and how, you know, changing the way you see yourself can alter the way you present yourself to clients and, you know, the, the amount of money you make. Uh, this is stuff I've been doing, you know, pretty much in my entire sales life. I just didn't realize that I was hypnotizing myself. Mm -hmm. uh, the way you presented it made me realize that, you know, I really, I guess I was hypnotizing myself and they had never looked at it in that way. So one thing I think that really helps them is to understand that hypnosis is nothing that's frightening or scary, that it's a very common state of mind, that it's actually something that you can learn to do. It's not, it's not even hard to learn. Uh, but if you learn it and use it, it really can push up your business production. It was one of the very few programs ever out there that showed people how to actually use hypnosis in a practical sense. Uh, of course, stopping smoking, weight control, pain control, those are, those are practical approaches, but more along the medical line. Uh, the line that I crossed was showing them how to use these in a business sense, how to use it to make more sales, to make more calls, to overcome your fear of rejection, to break through mental barriers, things of that nature. Yeah, and I'd reference to everybody, there is a Q&A box right beneath this live feed, and already some great questions have been coming in, uh, which I may save a couple of these for a little bit later, um, just to kind of keep on task here. Although actually, um, here's one, which by the way, if you're having some issues with the live feed, very easy, just refresh the page, that tends to restart the buffering. We're using a software platform that will actually buffer to your connection. So it's based actually in YouTube, so it'll re-render the quality based on your feed. So anyone having some technical things, just refresh the page and you'll all be set. Though, again, what questions do you have for the person who has entered the corporate market and was stepping up into that platform, stepping in front of that group, earning $5,000 and up? There's a phrase that I keep coming back to of think bigger think bigger. And this is definitely on that theme of thinking bigger. Uh, is, is there a story that stands out, Anthony, in terms of a group that has taken what you've shared with them and really set it into action? So not perhaps from your side of things, as we've been talking about so far, but what kind of feedback would you get from these organizations of the results uh, from learning these strategies from you, from a hypnotic perspective? Oh, goodness. That's, there's, there's dozens of them. Uh, we have entered when I when I first started doing these programs, which was back in 1980. You, most of you listening to this, don't even recall this. But back in 1980, the big things technologically were fax machines and copiers. That was the latest, you know. And kind of personal computers hadn't really broken onto the scene. They were getting popular, but they hadn't really broken on. And it wasn't until the like Windows 95 came along that you saw the internet and the internet browsers. So this was kind of before internet, before everything else, but you could see technological changing taking place. And people were starting to invest in computers. Uh, there wasn't a whole lot of people that had them in their home, but a lot of the businesses that I started walking in all of a sudden were computerizing. And when they computerized, they started getting more and more into metrics. I remember one guy from a um, Merrill Lynch uh, office, Supposedly, it was the biggest money-making Merrill Lynch office in the company. I recall him telling me that. And he had computerized everything. And, and here's what he did. He would sit down with his people and negotiate with them a, a quarterly contract. He would say to that, that broker, what do you think you can make in the next quarter? And the person would come up with a number. I think I can do you know $200,000 or whatever the number happened to be. And he might come back and say, well, actually, I, I think you do a lot better now. I think you do 400,000. And they would actually go back and forth until they agreed on a number. And let, let's say, just for the sake of argument, that they agreed that this broker could do 300,000, just, just as, as, as an example. Well, the broker, the guy, would go back to his desk and he'd program into his Apple computer the big web, that so-and-so over the next 12 weeks is going to generate... 300,000 in commission, how many, how much dollar production does this person need to be doing each week to stay on track to be making 300,000? And he said, 
every Monday morning, my people would come in and there's an envelope sitting on their desk because I print these out every Sunday night and they would open the envelope and it was, it was, a, it was a graph and it said, you know, here's what you said you were going to do. Remember we had that discussion and you said you were in the next 12 weeks going to do 300,000. Here is what you said you were going to do. And here's what you're actually doing. So it was one of the few times or first times when people could in real life, in real time, start plotting metrics because up to that point it was slide rules. I mean, they have to sit down and actually, you know, do the addition and subtraction. And now they could just plot these things on a, on a, on a curve. And he said it was incredibly valuable to him because he could see the person is on track. They're doing what they said they were going to do, or the person is way off track, or the person was doing great for the first four or five weeks. And then all of a sudden they fell off track. And when I saw that, I could bring them in and say to them, what's going on? Well, my spouse and I are having a problem and, you know, we're talking about breaking up. Anyway. So I, I could see that it was a temporary situation that the person was probably going to get back on track, but it, it alerted me to problems before they became endemic, before they had become so deeply entrenched that they were a problem. By me getting this real time metric information, I was able to monitor and actually help coach my people. And he claimed that because of that ability, he was at the time the number one Merrill Lynch office in the country. And I found that more and more and more uh, businesses started thinking like that. They started thinking in numbers and metrics. I equated the money ball, you know, for years, uh, f baseball players would send these scouts out who had had 30, 40, 50 years experience in baseball. And they would look at a pitcher, they'd look at a player and they'd say, based on my intuition, uh, this person's going to do well. So we, we should hire this person. But it wasn't based on metrics. It was based on knowledge and experience and feelings. And it was successful to a degree. But then this person comes along with a computer and starts actually plotting everything they were doing and saying, no, actually the metrics are telling me, if you look at these real time numbers, that this person who looks mediocre is actually going to start batting 300, you know, and, and this pitcher who you think isn't going to go anywhere is probably going to excel this year because here are what the metrics are telling me. And Moneyball revolutionized the game of baseball because it took it out of the intuition field and into the metrics field. And more and more and more businesses became revolutionized like that. And most of the industries that I was working with are now highly metrically oriented. I mean, to where these people come in and they know the numbers inside out, upside down and backwards. And that, that was a change. One thing that comes to mind and kind of a long story getting there, one company, New York Life company up in Northern New Jersey uh, and the manager, what they call the managing partner in those days, uh, he was the guy that ran this office of about 100 agents, and he was hiring me like every other year for like 10 years. Every other year, I'd get a call, and he was Mike McCormick. Come on up and you know, I want you to speak to my agency again, which was great. I mean, I, I like being hired 10 times, but <laughs> at one point, I remember we're having lunch, and I turned to him. I said, Mike, I'm just curious. Why do you keep hiring me? I mean, not many of my clients hire me you know, 10 times in a row. Why are you doing this? And he said, well, I'm into metrics and I keep very, very careful numbers. And my numbers tell me that every time you come in here, I make 20 grand. I said, what are you talking about? Well, I pay you your 10. He goes like, you come in here and you have a noticeable impact on a percentage of my people. So I'm going to be honest with you. Not everybody's affected by what you do, but you have enough of an effect with a enough, enough of my agents that numbers go up by about 30,000 over the next few weeks. I pay you your 20, your 10, the, I get, you know, my rider or whatever, and my rider becomes $20,000. So I pay your 10, I put 20 in my pocket, and that has been true every single year that I've hired you. As long as you keep doing that to my people, I'm going to keep bringing you in here. He goes, like, great. Unfortunately, he retired two years later, you know, broke my heart. <laughs> But the, that's metrics to the extreme. That's yeah, this, this kind of relates to a question that uh, in the chat room, Rachel just asked. She goes, I'm uh, interested in learning about how to create a regular income consistently with corporate work. Can I do that through group work? And that's technically what we're talking about here around uh, what I really want to highlight and unpack what Anthony just talked about there would be that, again, you know, to, to look at the training that you offer over at Corporate Hypnotist Masterclass, the flaw would be to go, yeah, but I'm not really a stage hypnotist. I'm more of the hypnotherapy side. 
And it's the same mechanism that you just did that I'll be doing later today where uh, by wonders of scheduling my two o'clock and my four o'clock appointment are actually husband and wife, but scheduled at different times just based on their timing. And the session with him is going to be one specific process. The session with her is going to be one specific process. And I don't know what these processes ought to be until they're here in my office and I'm learning, well, what's your challenge? What's the pain point? What's the thing you need to address? So it kind of comes back to, again, your second bullet point here of these three steps about how do you leave the audience better than you found them? It, it's that change worker mindset of what is it that they need to be doing? Where's the gap? There's a moment that I'd reference from when I attended the training with you that you had the entire room bursting into applause because remind me, and you know the reference right away, was it the Pitney Bowes video? Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, it was this experience of... This is Anthony's true skill. This is the biggest thing to learn from this man. Uh, that ability to really customize the message and the customization actually becomes easy when you learn the strategies, but to customize that message. And here you were with the postage company, Pitney Bowes, and it was some technical jargon that had to be folded in. And the way that you seamlessly fit that into the presentation that um, if I remember right, you were going, I still don't know what I said, but the audience is there going, hmm, yes, exactly. Right. <laughs> that, that's what the section I call the needs analysis. Yeah. And uh, I have heard a number of speakers in, in my life. And sometimes you go to a speaker and you go to the same speaker 10 years later and it's word for word. They haven't changed a thing. It's exactly the same spiel 10 years later. And uh, which is fine. I mean, there's nothing wrong with that. But I get bored hearing the same thing twice. It drives me nuts if I know that there are people in my audience that have heard me before because I don't want them hearing me say the same joke with the same inflection or the same funny thing. You know, so it, it annoyed me. Uh, and I realized that it, you could change it with a very, very simple thing, which is what I call needs analysis. Uh, prior, about two weeks prior to a speech, if you, if you were to hire me, Jason, to speak to your company uh, and you were the decision maker, I'd get you on the phone and I would ask you a few simple questions like, tell me, what do I call your people? Are they agents? Are they reps? Are they salespeople, team members? What's the nomenclature? So what, you know, I want to talk to them in, in the, the language that they speak in. What are, how do they think? Do they think in dollars of commission, production credits, uh, you know, numbers of sales, numbers of lives. I mean, there's different jargons for different uh, co corporations. And usually in 10 minutes, you can come up with their nomenclature. And I just make it a point to stick their name and their nomenclature in at certain points in my talk. And the net result is that it sounds like I am talking just to them. Uh, one of the things I do in the all day, in, in the two day program is I give people uh, I believe it's three completely uncut DVDs. And I say, the reason I'm giving you three is I want you to notice the first one's to Prudential Insurance, second one's to Pitney Bowes, and the third one is to call Greenpoint Mortgage. These companies are completely unrelated to each other, but I want you to see the presentations. And when you look at them, it's going to sound like I'm giving three totally different speeches. But if you strip away all the nomenclature, and listen, I'm giving the same speech three times. It's exactly the same concept. I'm just changing a few simple words. And by changing a few words, you change the emphasis. And so the people in Prudential are sitting there thinking, this guy took the time and effort to understand my company. If you're listening to Pitney Bowes, th those guys, well, this guy actually knows what we're talking about. This guy knows what we're going through. And it, it just, it makes the audience feel like you care enough to take some time to learn about them. And the, the, the speech doesn't have to be different. I had one of my graduates called me two weeks ago and uh, was slightly concerned. He had been hired by a insurance company and they had hired him for a single speech. He was going to talk to the salespeople. And then they called him back and they said, if we pay, you know, paid you more, well, could you also give a speech that same day later in the afternoon to our sales managers and then later in the evening to all the staff? And he was like panicky. He was going, I got to give three speeches in one day. And I stopped and I, Jack, I said, what are you panicking about? I said, what are you talking about? He said, give the same speech three times. What are you talking about? Well, I showed you how to do this in the program. When you're talking to the first speech, talk to the salespeople and find out what their nomenclature is. 
number of sales, dollars of commission, production credits or whatever, plug that in. And then in the afternoon, give the same speech. But now you're talking about recruiting goals, hours spent each week managing and training recruits, doing the testing, the things that are germane to salespeople. And then in the evening, give the same speech. But this time, the emphasis should be on what the staff is is facing. And so I'll tell you, when you do things like staff, which are a bit nebulous, different, different staff are doing different things, that's when you can throw in things like, and self-hypnosis can be used to lose weight, control pain, stop biting your nails, stop smoking. So that's what, that's what they would find more. So now you, you don't have to learn three speeches. All you gotta do is learn one speech and stick different stuff in at key points. And he was like, it was funny. He was like, oh, I forgot about that. Perfect. <laughs> that I can do, you know? So instead of having to go out and kind of create or memorize three speeches, you really don't have to do that, which is why I include those DVDs. I want you guys to see at first glance, when you look at these DVDs, it kind of looks like I'm giving three totally different speeches. But if you strip away the nomenclature, what you'll see is that it's the same core message, the same speech. Which is a similar hypnotic formula to right. even how we would look at let's say if it's a stage hypnosis show that even though we should perhaps change up our routines if we're working the same groups, um, the same hypnotic suggestion could get an entirely different reaction from one other person and take on a whole different perspective. So Precisely. it's learning that systematic way of thinking about so learning that structure. Um, our third point, and I love that you have expertly uh, addressed every one of these points before I could ask you about them, uh, <laughs> which is all about how do you stand out in this market? What's wh What are some of the strategies that people can do? I had a couple of questions from uh, Ron in Hawaii was asking about approaching organizations, a few other questions coming in in terms of just the approach. What is it? And, and I'd give a preview here. Uh, again, all the details for the upcoming training, which is October 25th and 26th in Las Vegas, simply corporatehypnotistmasterclass.com. Um, there's an oh wow moment, which I believe you said you're going to do more time on this next go round, where you were actually picking up the phone on speakerphone, right. and showing us step by step exactly how you made these connections. And even better, my favorite part is you were telling them your name was Jason Lynette. You live right. in right. <laughs> <laughs> uh, So it's the real work as opposed to just theory. But let's address that bigger picture perspective here of you know approaching these organizations. How does someone get started? How does someone get noticed? How do they stand out? Well, first of all, to, to answer what I think was your first question, the initial part of that question was, how do you become different than the 8 million and one other speakers trying to do it? Hypnosis solves that problem. Trust yeah. me, there's just not a whole bunch of people out there doing it. And some people say, well, you know, I'm afraid of flooding the market with people that are using hypnosis. Let me tell you something. If you go to NSA, National Speakers Association, and you look at the speakers whose topic is leadership or whose topic is time management or attitude, you're going to see like 7,000 speakers talking about time management. You can't saturate hypnosis because it's different. It's unique for each and every person. It's... Uh, absolutely mind-boggling it's one of those things where people would come to my presentation sometimes three or four times and i'd look at me aren't you bored with this yet i mean I, you've seen my presentation I, i'd go a hundred times to see you because because every subject is different you know every every uh even though i might do the same kind of bits and routines and all they're like totally different than the last time because people respond different so what makes you stand out the hypnosis de facto is built in. That's the, the given that makes you stand out as opposed to your ho-hum talk about attitude or leadership or you know, other topics that are, that are, that are fairly common. So to and, clarify, you're using the hypnosis as one of the strategies as again, you know, because the same argument can be made. There's hundreds representing from leadership, hundreds representing in this thing. Let's say dozens truly representing as a stage hypnotist who works the corporate market. Right. But to really dwindle that down and really stand out is that you're teaching these actionable strategies and one of which happens to be the hypnosis. Right. Yeah. And, and the, I'm going to be repetitious here, but a number of times people come up and comment and say, 
I never realized it until you kind of put it the way you put it, but I guess I've been hypnotizing myself for years because I am a top salesperson and I have been doing these strategies that you talk about, about the repeated visualization, about forming these clear, vivid pictures, about doing, you know, writing your goals down repetitiously, things of that nature. Uh, I did all that. And it's one of the reasons why I rose to the top of the profession, but I never would have guessed that what I was doing was, you know, self-hypnosis. I didn't really, that didn't click until you connected the dots for me. Uh, so, uh, you know, had you told me prior to your presentation that I've been hypnotizing myself for years, I'd have told you you were off your rocker. But now, based on the way you explained it to me, I guess I was. You know? So that is, is something that, that most people have um, an insight to the way that they've uh, behaved and been behaving. So yeah, the de facto, the hypnosis de facto makes you unique at what you do. Now, the next part of your question, if I heard was, how do you actually penetrate a market? How do you get yourself booked? Well, the first thing I think you do is you pick a market and it, it could be anything. Uh, when I started, I was in an unusual situation. As I, I mentioned this in the program, you know, for years, I didn't tell anybody this because it just really wasn't relevant to what I was doing. I started from scratch. I mean, I had moved out to a remote corner of the Hawaiian Islands. I lived in an area that had no television, no public water, no um, TV, I mean, no, what do you call it, um, telephones. I was in the middle of nowhere. I had to drive five or six miles to get to the nearest telephone, and I knew no one. I mean, I had moved from the mainland, didn't know my neighbors, absolutely knew no one, and started the business. I, I, I could not have put myself in a worse situation to try to start a new business. And I'll tell you what I did. I picked up the phone, got in the car one day, drove down, picked up the phone, and started making phone calls. And I just started calling real estate companies, telling these people that I'm a speaker, I want to come in and talk to your group, no cost, no obligation. But at the end of my 20, 30 minute talk, I'm going to see if people will sign up for my all day program. And as I mentioned in, in the uh, seminar, the first day I did it, I got people who agreed to let me come in and speak to their group. And I recall driving back home thinking to myself, you know, this, this is going to be easy. And it wasn't easy. But when I drove over to give the speeches a couple of weeks later, what was interesting is that a number of the managers who had given me permission to come in and speak to their sales forces, I believe two out of three of them made a very similar comment because it stuck. And the comment was, you know, we get people calling all the time wanting to speak to our sales force. We get people who want to sell them this or sell them that. You know, we've got 50, 100 salespeople. We get calls from people all the time that want to come in and address our sales force. But when you call, you just, you know, you had this energy. You were exciting. You were exciting to listen to. And you, you kind of made me want to meet you, you know, because they, and I, I swear, I was flying back. I lived on a different island. I lived on the big island. I'm flying back to the big island that night and I was just racking my brain what did I say? I could not even remember what I said. Whatever it is I said, that's worth money. You know what I mean? What, what was it that these people were hearing? And I finally realized it. It's crazy, but it's true. The, the place that I had to go make phone calls was in a guy's open air garage. I have to go down into the garage and he had a terrible mosquito problem. And the mosquitoes in Hawaii are like huge. And I wasn't making calls in a suit and tie. I was making calls in a tank top and shorts and sandals. And I'm down there in the dark making these calls. And the entire time I'm dancing, jumping, the whole just trying to keep these mosquitoes from devouring me. The person on the other side of that phone call didn't know that's what I was doing. All they knew was this person sounds exciting. <laughs> this person yeah. sounds charged up, man. This person is filled with energy. And it, so it was- want to break it, into the corporate market. You I mean, you talk, it sounds crazy, but it's a lesson. I created a garage, a mosquito right. infestation. Uh <laughs> I never forgot that lesson because it was actual and it was real. And you know, I, I recall Ronald Reagan had a statement, nothing sells like conviction. Yeah. And when I was calling, I was like, I want to get off this phone call as fast as humanly possible. I want to get this booking, get the heck off this call because I'm getting killed here. And they didn't know that, but it was a message that I never forgot. So I will rarely pick up a telephone. If you, if you call me at midnight by accident, you know, I may be coming out of a sleep, but I won't pick up the phone until I'm awake, until I'm kind of like fired up 
because I learned early on that people respond to passion. They respond to enthusiasm. So I, I, I'll show you in the program exactly how to target a market. I give people scripts word for word. You know, here's here's if you get the admin. Here's and you did it actually in front of us too, and you got through to decision makers as well, which was that oh wow moment. Uh, I, I had a question. Um, oh yeah, the dates uh, October twenty fifth, twenty sixth in Las Vegas. Again, all the details over at corporate hypnotist masterclass dot com. There is a, I'm cheating off of another screen here. There's a promo running uh, at the moment through to the end of August that if you sign up now, um, it's $500 off and you get a bonus coaching session with Anthony before the training. Christian from Uruguay. Uh, we are going right Christian. now. Go Christian. Yeah, we got, uh, he, he basically was looking for some more information and it may be a geographic thing where he is um, about dealing with the hypnosis stigma, quote, taboo thing strategies to use that if that is the way to stand out in the market what if the group you're approaching has a stigma around that well you plow through it i know it sounds plastic but when i when i started the business i the nearest town i lived to was hilo hawaii this was in 1980 the entire city was the second largest city in hawaii it had 39,000 people and 60 percent of them were japanese and the Japanese just don't do hypnotherapy. <laughs> they just don't do it. So I had a very small sample space, which was cut by two thirds because of the stupid place I located myself. And I just went out there and knocked it down. I just went out and just did it. Part of it was ignorance. I didn't know that you couldn't do it. So there wasn't anybody out there telling me, Japanese don't go for this. They're not gonna buy your product or service. They're not into, no one told me that, so I didn't know. So if they weren't responding, I figured it must be something I'm saying or doing wrong. So I turned my, instead of blaming them or blaming the market or having an excuse for not succeeding, I turned myself, okay, what, what am I not doing correct here? And that was another valuable lesson where strangely enough, it's all under my control to a very great degree, not all of it, but to a very great degree. I'm the one that's pulling those strings, whether I realize it or not. So, uh, I went out, I went out and just made it happen. And I know that's, again, easy to say, not so easy to do. I just decided I loved hypnosis. I decided this is what I wanted to do with my life. I had no mentor. Nobody else was doing it. There was no book I could buy. There was no program I could watch. There was nobody I could call and say, hey, you know, can I come to your program? Would you teach me how to do it? None of that existed. I had to go out and learn the hard way. And I learned the hard way. I mean, I made every mistake you could possibly make twice, but I just, I also learned that if you, if you have a passion, if you really love something, if you're committed to making it work, you can make almost anything work. Yeah. I'd share two points on that. One is just very clearly that having gone through your course, again, it's the experience of 40 years of experience in that market and the two very, very tightly packed days of full content and really getting the strategy, shortening that learning curve where you can make use of what you've learned here in this presentation today and kind of muscle your way through it, as opposed to you just get up there and say, here, start with this. Here's the way to approach these groups. On that question about the hypnosis stigma thing, this weekend I'm at the NGH convention doing a presentation one morning on just network marketing of Chamber of Commerce, BNI groups to get out there and talk about hypnosis. When when I had the when I had the mindset of I'm going to passionately talk about what I care about, and by accident that's going to get me a lot of clients. Yeah. And when it was that mindset, uh, he may not always be the best person to reference, but Jordan Belfort, the guy behind Wolf of Wall Street, uh, would tell his sales staff the three keys would be forced to be reckoned with, ruthless as hell, and enthusiastic, or something of that nature of, again, being in that mode, being in that excitable state of um, just freaking care about what you do and people will follow. <laughs> no, honest to God, it's... It, it's you know, it's easy for me to look back and say that it wasn't easy doing it. There yeah. was, you know, there was a lot of times where it was the, there was the temptation to give up and just this isn't it ever going to turn around. But and it's not I, perhaps always the best phrase, but with experience comes the ability to quote, turn it on if you have to. Yeah. And yeah. I, I've got the attitude now where there's really nothing I can't do if, if I put my mind to it, which is, you know, a really nice attitude to have. It really uh, shows you 
that you really can accomplish things that otherwise under normal circumstances you would have thought were just plain impossible. So just do it is, is yeah. uh, we great. have some awesome That's questions plastic coming advice, in. You know, I mean, it's not <laughs> yeah, we've but, got some awesome questions coming in by the Q and a box. You good for another yeah. 15 minutes or so, Anthony? Yeah, sure. Absolutely. Awesome. Yeah. So if you've got questions, put them in the box and I will feed them on in, <laughs> uh, the dates for the upcoming training in Las Vegas with Anthony, October 25th and 26th uh, in Las Vegas. Again, all the details, the promo is currently active over at corporatehypnotistmasterclass.com. Rather than having to reinvent the wheel, he will hand you the wheel and show you how to put that thing into use, which I believe is a metaphor I even heard you say in that course. Um, I got a question here from John, Yes. Um, which... Uh, I love this one. Uh, I'll just read it and then we'll unpack it. Uh, is your technique of doing a big group induction on the audience as a whole more so for the greatest number of participants that go over versus the typical stage hypnosis approach of calling up X amount of... Let me set the stage for everybody else. John, clearly you have a ton of videos on YouTube and those of you in this audience, if you haven't seen Anthony in action, head over to YouTube, just search his name. You will see what we're talking about. Um, and yes, it was a class more so on what to present, uh, how to approach the speakers bureaus, which Gary had a question about that. We'll come to that one in a few moments. Um, so it's not just the what to say, how to put it all together, how to stand out the actual ins and outs of these specific steps. But one of those oh wow moments is the method that you do the hypnotic induction very differently, which in the scope of what we're addressing today, we probably don't have time to get into the full details of, of course, but share with us just kind of the philosophy that I heard you say something that immediately changed all of my programs, not just the ones I do for a corporate group of you're looking for that cream of the crop. You're looking at it from a much different, higher perspective. Yeah, it's, uh, I had a challenge back in 1986. I had been working for years doing these all day programs in the financial services industry. And I was invited to speak at a premier convention. It's called MDRT, Million Dollar Roundtable. Anybody who gives speeches in financial services will tell you that this, this is it. I mean, you're nobody unless you've been an MDRT speaker and this is kind of making your bones. So I was finally invited to speak, big deal. And uh, they tell you in October that you're going to speak in June. So you have quite a few months to prepare for this. And I got the notification and they connect you with what's called an MDRT moderator. And I get a call from this guy. Hi, I'm going to be your moderator. I'm going to walk you through, help you rehearse your speech, blah, blah, blah. And he says, well, what are you going to talk about? And they had given me 55 minutes to speak, which is not a lot of time. Uh, up until that point, I was doing all day programs. And one of the sections of my all day program was teaching people self hypnosis. And if I wanted to, I could have taken two hours to do it. You know, I mean, it was, I was under control and I had all the time in the world with an all day program. Well, they come in, they say, I have 55 minutes. So immediately I said to myself, well, I'm not going to do the hypnosis because it's going to take me at least 20, 25 minutes to do the subject, do the inductions, you know, get a person in deep hypnosis, deep enough to do something. That doesn't leave me any time to do content, which would leave them with something serious and to, to do a demonstration. I mean, I, I eat up all my time just getting people in hypnosis. So the MDRT moderator calls me and he says, what, what are you going to speak about? And I said, well, I've got this excellent technique on getting your goals on a, a cassette tape spaced repetition. And I think that'd be an excellent technique. And he said, well, I heard you do this thing where you teach people self-hypnosis. And I said, yeah, but I, I wouldn't do that at MDRT. He said, why not? Well, you know, my experience or my, my understanding is that these guys are very conservative, very, very staid. I'm not sure it would go over as well. Plus I only have 55 minutes. You know, I don't think I'll have enough time to actually pull it off. And he talked me out of it. He said, you know, actually I've talked to people that have seen it and I think it will be a hit. It's different. I think, you know, this is this is a big shot for you. If you can make an impression with MDRT, you'll be busy for the next 20 years. Uh, if I were you, I'd, I'd do it. I'd take a shot at it. And this is the MDRT moderator telling me this. So I figured, okay. But my challenge was I only have 55 minutes. And 30 of those 55 are going to get eaten up by my induction. Something's got to give. So I started, I mean, I was obsessed with it. I would think about it all the time. How can I shorten the induction? How can I you know, get good people in a shorter period of time. So I have more time to do a demonstration and leave them with content and da, 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 da. And one day I woke up 
and it was like you know, one of those things where the idea was just fully formed in my head. I woke up and there it was. It was just staring me in the face. And the idea was simple, but it was it was an insight. And it was that, you know, as a an experimental psychologist, you're taught as an experimental psychologist to look at numbers, that it's it's metrics, it's all numbers and statistically oriented. And I'd known for years that the numbers of hypnosis in terms of random distributions, one out of 10 people on the average are gonna be very good hypnotic subjects. The bell curve sooner or later always takes hold with large numbers of people. So if I have a large audience and I knew I was gonna have like four or 5,000 people, that one out of 10 of them, probably one out of 100 will be super subjects. So I know I've got a sample space of maybe 40 or 50 really great subjects sitting in front of me. The question was, how do I find them? Because what most people used to do or did was they'll say, okay, I got 25 chairs up here. Let's get 25 people. They do this big, long, boring induction and they start throwing people back. You know, you're not going to be able to tell you, you can go back, you can go back and they end up with their five out of the 25 and they use them to do their demonstration. That took way too much time, way too cumbersome. So in my mind, I just said, all right, what can I do to flip it around? What can I do to take maybe five minutes to segregate the really good subjects and pick really good subjects so that I don't have to be doing a 25 minute long induction? And of course, the standard and suggestibility tests were good enough. First thing was, you know, the Comstock or the what they call magnetic fingers test. That's to get people in the mindset. Almost everybody responds positively to do this. This takes maybe two or three minutes. Uh, not amazing. Uh, yeah. Well, let me show you another test. This is called the arm rising and falling test. And I used that test because I knew that there would be a percentage of people that dramatically responded to this. Some people really want to be hypnotized. So they do this. You know, that's not what I'm looking for. Some people are doing it and you see they're gritting their teeth or they're moving around, or they're clenching their fists. That's not what I'm looking for. I, I knew what I was looking for. I was looking for the hand moving up in what's called a vesiculated motion, the ironed out facial expression, the slow, regular breathing, the catalepsy. And I said to myself, all right, if I do this second test and if I pay real close attention and I learn to recognize the good subjects, if I pick the right good subjects, I don't even need an induction. It, if you get- Which for those of you that haven't seen it, the appearance of this, again, go to YouTube and you'll be able to track down some clips of this. The stage appearances, Anthony just brings these people up on stage, a quick moment of an eye fixation, and then they're flopping over the people next to them. It is the ultimate induction that is just so cool looking. If you pick the right, seven or eight people you have a phenomenal demonstration if you pick the wrong seven or eight people it's a you long very long minutes. demonstration <laughs> it's like so so i got real good at picking the right subjects i mean that's what my focus of attention was and it worked it, so uh, what about you mentioned the induction what about uh, another question here a couple of people already chimed in with this one uh what about routines that are appropriate for the corporate audience well if you look at most of the routines i do uh, most of them are routines that have been done for years. I, you know, I, I came up with a couple of my own, but most of them were standard routines. Here's what made them corporate routines. Uh, take a, a bottle, you know, empty bottle. Tell a hypnotized subject that bottle weighs 10,000 pounds. And if they accept that suggestion, you know, they'll be struggling, veins bulging out of their neck. They can't lift the bottle. And I would use that as a metaphor. I would say, all right, clearly bottle weighs two or three ounces. But in their mind, they see it as weighing 10,000 pounds. Their perception is it weighs 10,000 pounds. Which part do you see winning out? The reality or the perception? Well, what you see is the perception. And this is no different than sales and business. You'll tell a person, you could be selling million dollar policies. No, I can't. I don't know how to deal with rich people. I always, you know, I'm not a good closer. That's the, the perception. But the fact is they could sell million dollar policies just as good as anybody else. So I would use a standard hypnotic thing and tie it to a business message. And depending on what the theme of the talk was, you know, like I said, if I'm talking to sales people, which is different than talking to managers, which is different than talking to staff, I would relate the hypnotic phenomenon to that particular group. If it was sales, uh, I'd tell a person that, if you've seen this if it's on YouTube, that I'll take one of their shoes off, put it in their hand, tell them when they wake up, 
they'll discover the shoe's missing, they won't be able to find it. It's called negative hallucination, not being able to find the shoe. And the really good subjects look right through the shoe. I mean, they're looking all over for it. It's, it's kind of funny as could be, but it's, it's real. I mean, they cannot see the shoe. And the audience is going crazy and they're laughing. And, and here's how I make it a corporate message. I'll say, before you laugh at that person, how many times have you run around looking for your car keys and they're in your hand, or you run around looking for your eyeglasses and they're sitting up on your head? <laughs> what, what this person who can't see their shoe is actually doing is illustrating a tremendous ability to concentrate. They're able to concentrate so well that if they want to, they can literally wipe something out, literally not see what's right before their very eyes. And you're doing the same thing in business. If you don't like asking for referrals, you'll just wipe it out of your mind. You'll to afterwards, oh, I totally forgot again. If you don't, you know, if you're a manager or sales manager and you don't like recruiting, you'll go to a social function or a PTA meeting and you'll meet a prospective person who would be an excellent recruit and you don't even think of them as a recruit. You look right through them. So the, the thing about hypnosis that is fascinating is that you will never see anything in hypnosis that you won't see out of it. I know that strikes people as odd, but anything you see in hypnosis, you see out of it. And they say, well, well, how about pain control? You know, I've, I've seen a person had an operation without hypnosis, how, with hypnosis, without uh, anesthesia. How could that be the same thing all the time? You ever fix your car, do yard work or something, and you're in the house washing up and you look down and there's a gash on your hand. You have no idea where it came from. And then it hurts. Well, when you were out doing the yard work, mentally, you were totally fixated on something else. The the injury was being received, the signals were being sent to your brain, but they weren't being interpreted as pain. You were somewhere else. And then as soon as you see it and make the connection, then it hurts. So the odd thing is you don't see anything in hypnosis you don't see otherwise. Negative hallucination, like I say, you look through your eyeglasses is a negative hallucination. If you're wearing eyeglasses, you have long ago learned to look right through those panes of glass without seeing the panes of glass anymore. Which takes it up from that. It's taking a standard routine and putting that spin about how is it someone's making use of this? How is someone already doing this? Uh, and how can they do it better? The same that I, I work with a client and you know, you know you want to quit smoking and yet they were on sale and you purchased a whole carton of them. You know you're safer on the airplane. Here's how you're already doing, this kind of addresses the question from earlier about the stigma. Here's how basically you're already doing it and uh, use the superhero phrase. So here's how you use the powers for good rather than evil. I give a quick avoid plug the word here evil. once again. I want to hear uh, a <laughs> great question perfectly came in time here. Um, the upcoming training again in Las Vegas, October yes. 25th and 26th. You get the entire system behind this, how to approach the speakers, bureaus, what to do in your presentations. You get a model to really follow. Perfectly timed question from John. Uh, have any of your students replicated uh, what you've been doing? And yes. I have you know, the answer. Tell doing us about it? some of the results that students have had. Precisely. And uh, the, the paradox is that right after the first program, one of the attendees went out and formed a private Facebook page, Facebook um, group page. And only people that have graduated from my program are allowed into this page. And they did it because they kind of feel like they're the chosen ones. They've spent the effort and the money and, you know, they don't want really, it's, it's you know, I'm not sure I adhere to that, but they, they don't want it getting all spread around. They want, you know, they paid for it. It's theirs. And they're very supportive. I mean, on that group page, they're all helping each other, giving each other ideas, but it gives a false impression because they go to my program and then they disappear. You never hear from them again. And in fact, they're doing gangbusters. Some of them are doing really great. Um, I'm not sure if these folks would uh, have any difficulty with me using their names, but I'll, I'll give you a couple names if you'd like to, to check on people that are just off the top of my head. If you look at Jack Hirsch is out there knocking it down. If you look at da Dan Candell is out there doing it. Goodness gracious, there's, there's a couple dozen. And the ones that aren't doing it, aren't doing it. Let me explain. That sounds odd, but the, I, I do follow-ups and I keep in touch with these people and they'll say to me, the reason I'm not scheduling bookings is I haven't picked up the phone or I got all wrapped up with this one project and as soon as I finish this project, then I'm going to go and do it. It's not because what you showed me doesn't work. I, what you showed me works. You know, and I, I go to the group page and I see 
the ones that are doing it are really doing it. You know, they've really broken into the market. And, and the only reason I'm not doing it is because I'm not picking up the phone. I acknowledge that, but this has come up or that's come up and you know, I'm going to be doing it in the future or whatever. I had the perfect follow-up question. What? Yeah. Kind of you know, but I, I can understand where they see all these people, <laughs> they see these pictures of the people that graduate from the program and then they, they never hear from them again. And the question is, did they, you know, did they just fall off the earth? No, no, no. They're all over on their own group page and they don't want anybody else over there, but then. Just- <laughs> John was asking if you have any insight as to the fees they've been earning as they've just entered the corporate market. Yeah. I tell, look, I tell them I hammer this home. It's 5,000 and up. I mean, don't, you, you should not be uh, billing yourself as anything less than 5,000. Now, if you say the fee is 5,000, the client comes back and says, all we have is 3,000 and we live down the street from you and you want to make a decision to take 3,000, that's one thing, but get yourself in the habit, your fee is 5,000 and then move it up as fast as you can. And that was, uh, there's a, uh, Jason Christopher is another name. If you look on either my uh, Facebook page or the Corporate Hypnotist, the one that's open to the public, Jason published a thing just two or three days ago. Hi, I'm on my way back from my $5,000 talk. So much more fun getting 5,000 than two. Uh, you know, he's got a little video that he just posted the other day. So the ones that, the ones that, the ones that are doing it are doing it. Uh, they're not all doing it. I'm not going to lie to you. Some of them just haven't picked up the phone, you know, it's, it, but it's not because the system doesn't work. It's because something has come up or they, you know, haven't gotten around to starting it yet. But uh, if you call any of the people, and I'd be happy to give you some names of people that have you know, gone to the program, I don't have dissatisfied customers. I've not had anyone that called up and said, this isn't what I expected, or I did not get what I wanted or needed to be a corporate speaker. It's, I know it works. Yeah, and before we wrap up again, all the details over at corporatehypnotistmasterclass.com. Uh, but the main bullet points of breaking into the corporate market would be learning what to speak about, uh, standing out to that audience basically by answering the question of how do I leave them better than I found them, right. and then using your skills as the hypnotist to truly stand out. And uh, we'll fold in the fourth uh, step of really be passionate about what you have to offer. Anthony, it's been awesome having you on here. You know, I always enjoy talking to you, Jason. You teach me something new every single time I talk to you. And that, you know, I really appreciate. I just think you're, you know, 10 times more than I do about certain topics. And it annoys well, me. I recommend everybody <laughs> stick around and uh, engage with the replay as we make this one available because there's nuggets inside of this having gone through Anthony's training myself uh, where he really shared with you the work in terms of how do you put this all in and how do you put it all into use? And a final question came in from Mike. Do you have to be a stage hypnotist first? I can probably answer that, that I would actually say, yes, the stage hypnotist is going to have a lot of experience coming into this. Uh, but even the hypnotherapeutic mindset entering into this, um, may be a slight advantage possibly because they're not coming in with the world's fastest, world's funniest, uh, crutch to have to let go of. You got to you got to have something to say is the, is the key. Can I have 30 seconds? Go and for I, it. I can't believe I almost forgot this. I got an email from a guy named uh, Rod Soderstrom a couple days ago and he said, "Guys, as far as what I'd like to get out of the webinar, question, what's the best way to approach organizations and optimum types of skits for hypnosis groups?" Best way to approach organizations is to pick up a phone find out when they have meetings and who the decision maker is, put together a demo video, get that person on the phone and say, do you have a smartphone or whatever? Let's watch my demo together. It's only two minutes long. Let's you and I sit down. I can answer any questions you have. That's the best way to get in touch with people, to identify a target. And I'll tell you right now, it changes over the years. Uh, I, I opened up my talk earlier by saying when I started in 1980, it was copiers and fax machines. Crazy as it sounds, that's where all the salespeople were. But the market doesn't even exist anymore. Today, it's software sales. It's it's um, corporate, uh, what do you call it, uh, know, consulting firms, et cetera. The market shifts over time. At one period, it was all the dot-com companies. At another period, it was the housing market. It comes and it goes with economic trends. Right now, it's going to be software sales and and um, uh, corporate, well, I can't think of that name, is consulting firms. And the optimum types of skits for corporate events, 
They have to be clean, no religion or politics, something that carries a message. It could be, and it could be anything. Like I said, not being able to find your shoe is remarkable. It's funny as heck, but it communicates a very powerful message of literally not being able to see what's right before your very eyes. So anything that you can do that connects it to a powerful, that makes them stop and think, you know, geez, that is what I'm doing in my business, makes it a powerful corporate message. It's Jason Lynette here, and as always, thank you so much for your positive feedback on this program. Thank you so much for leaving your reviews over on iTunes, as well as sharing this content on Facebook. And I'll once again share the stage with Anthony uh, during this uh, wrap-up here to encourage you to head over to Corporate Hypnotist Masterclass.com. I attended the training with Anthony back in March 2017 and just found it to be an absolutely outstanding presentation. So again, head over to corporate hypnotist masterclass.com. Thanks so much for interacting with this program. Look forward to seeing you soon. Hey, it's Jason here, and I want you to be the first to find out as we upload new content here online. So do this right now. Click subscribe right next to this video, and you will be the first to find out as I share further resources, further downloads, and other really cool things to come your way. See you soon.